Shalom, I'm Chris. Let's follow Jesus along the Talmudim way. Acts chapter 23, we're continuing Paul's defense, and in this chapter, Paul will be moved from Jerusalem to Caesarea, so he will say goodbye to Jerusalem. Father, we ask you to bless our study and have us be like the Bereans who received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things be so. And by the study, enable each of us to be doers of your word and not just hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen. So we left last time with Lysias, the Roman commander, hoping that cooler heads would prevail. He had just plucked Paul from another near riot on the temple grounds, and he decides to call a meeting of the Jewish council and uh, not have another mob scene with the general public. He's trying to uh, get rid of this problem as, as best he can, and perhaps similar to Pilate, he's hoping that this could be a internal Jewish problem, not a Roman one that he would have to deal with. Now, uh, verse twenty, chapter 23, verse 1. Now, looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life with an entirely good conscience before God up to this day. So here he begins his second defense of the six that are recorded in Acts. He's before the council, uh, or also called the Sanhedrin, which was the governing Jewish body in Jerusalem over Jewish matters. So it was the religious council. Paul clearly was not intimidated by this group, and he probably knew some of the members personally back from his pre-transformation days when he had got letters to go to Damascus and round up the believers there. If he was not a member of the Sanhedrin uh, formally, he was probably, you know, as I said, well-known, he had the right access. Shimon ben Gamaliel was the son of Paul's teacher, and likely they were similar age and perhaps studied together. He's He was a known member of the Sanhedrin at this time. There was another guy, Yochanan ben Zakai, which was an, another member. And as the Chosen is portraying, you know, we can't assume that the Sanhedrin was unified in their opposition to the, the Yeshua, the Messiah movement. Many Pharisees, such as Shimon and, uh, and Yochanan, were opposed violently to the, to the Sadducees. Um, Zakai might have even known Nicodemus, and at a minimum, we, we know that his writings uh, tell us he at least respected the teaching of Jesus. Whether they're believers or not, you know, we have no idea, but uh, they, they weren't all opposed. If we need another piece of evidence that Paul is uh, Jewish to the end, here it is. If Paul had renounced Judaism, he would have had no need to go before this this council. Their approval or lack thereof would have meant you know absolutely nothing to him, as it, as it would not mean anything to any of us. But instead, he uses this term uh, politiumai, uh, which means literally to live as a good citizen. It carries the sense of living righteously or blamelessly, which we remember doesn't mean perfect. Um, the NASB translates it here as "I have lived in good conscience." It's in the sense of I have lived according to the Torah is how it's being used here. And Josephus actually uses the same word in the same sense. But the high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law, order me to be struck? So this is Ananias. Don't confuse him with Annas, the priest of, Jew of Jesus's trial. The, the two of them were actually political rivals, even though they were both Sadducees. So no one was getting along, and you know there's all kinds of strange enemies and alliances going on here, just as there are today, as a matter of fact. So this is a different Ananias also from those we've met previously in Acts. Both, both Josephus and the Talmud view this Ananias with disdain, and because he was just entirely corrupt. Possibly he ordered Paul struck because he thought Paul was lying to him, which which would have been a violation of the law. But whatever the reason, this was a strong breach of etiquette protocol, strong breach of rules that caught Paul by surprise. A prisoner was not supposed to be punished before being convicted, nor mistreated while on trial, and Paul had not been charged with any wrongdoing here. When someone is perceived as a threat, it's it's amazing how fast the normal rules get set aside, and you know they're they're too dangerous to to be left alone, and the ends justify the means, and you know we see, we see this all the time. When while Ananias violated the law based on Paul's forthcoming apology, most commentators see this as Paul's pride getting the best of him here. 
Whitewash is a, a, a reference Jesus also used, and it can be used to cover the blemishes on a wall without actually fixing them. So it's just paint. You paint, you know, paint over the hole to make it look look you know normal. Uh, in the same way, Paul's suggesting here the Sanhedrin looked good on the outside, but were not actually good people. Whether in the right or not, Paul certainly got off on the wrong foot with a crowd, and not even uh, anyone otherwise sympathetic to Paul's case could defend calling down a curse on the high priest. Recall Jesus didn't react emotionally when the same thing happened to him, and we can compare the two and you know see which which way we ought to go. John 18, 23, Jesus answered him, if I have spoken, so Jesus has slapped also, uh, and he responds, if I have spoken wrongly, testify of the wrong, but if rightly, why do you strike me? So Paul reacted, Jesus stayed calm and sought understanding. So the answer there is be like Jesus. But those present said, are you insulting God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brothers, that he is the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So we don't know if this is a manifestation of Paul's eye problem. But in any case, Exodus 22 verse 8 says, you shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. So Paul was for whatever reason, Paul was in the wrong here. The high priest might not have been wearing his official garments if this you know, uh, trial was quickly brought together. In any case, Saul's, uh, Paul's self-rebuke is definitely indicated here. Um, one of the many references here that reminds us today that the Bible gives us no license to complain about our government or elected officials, no matter how corrupt they might be. We, we are not to curse a ruler of our people. And we are to pray for them, which is what Paul will talk about in many uh, other parts of his letters. So things here clearly were not going well for Paul. It gets off on the t entirely the wrong foot. Any sympathy that the strike might have gained him from uh, from you know people on his side in the audience would have been quick, uh, quickly lost by here, uh, his rash words here. But Paul will cleverly rectify the situation. Paul, perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, began crying out in the council, "Brothers, I am a Pharisee." A son of Pharisees, I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. When he had said this, a dissension occurred between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. Based on verse 11, which we'll get to in a moment, Paul appears to have presented his entire testimony to the council. And maybe because it was much the same as before Paul, uh, Luke, I'm sorry, omitted it and just skipped ahead to the end. The reaction of the Pharisees here implies that they had heard enough to, to render a judgment, which we'll get to. So uh, first, let's look at this Pharisee, right? So Paul speaks of, of himself as a Pharisee. I am a Pharisee. He doesn't say I was a Pharisee. And this causes us to say, well, wait a minute, aren't, aren't Pharisees supposed to be the bad guys in the Bible? And I had thought this until this very verse was pointed out to me. Paul says, I am a Pharisee. Many of our commentaries try to dodge this issue by explaining that either he used to be a Pharisee or he was just saying it to curry favor with the current Pharisee group and, and didn't really mean it. Now, as we've talked about before, one issue with that conclusion is that this is a formal hearing and any form of lying is, is as if Paul committed perjury. And he would have violated the very commandments if he had done that, that he purports to uphold. So I, I you know, you think this through and it's, you, you can't get around to any other conclusion that Paul remained Jewish throughout his days, even though it's so common in our days to be taught that Paul renounced Judaism and he started a new Christian religion. That's just not the case. We have to, we have to be a little bit more uh, careful in our reading. If he truly was not a Pharisee, then his statement would have been easy to discredit because he knew a lot of the people there and a lot of people knew him. So the only conclusion we can reach is that after his so-called conversion on the Damascus Road, Paul remained a well-known Pharisee who conducted himself according to the practice of the Pharisees, at least as so far as those practices didn't conflict with Jesus's teaching. Jesus, by the way, uh, was very aligned with the Pharisees, and it was kind of the areas where he wasn't, which is why they became such a big deal. It's like he's uh, the authors, the gospel authors are pointing those out because otherwise, you know, it, they're they're very much aligned. So after giving his testimony, he, he quite intentionally and, and shrewdly creates a wedge between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and then Luke's going to explain what, what the beef is here. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And a great uproar occurred, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and started arguing heatedly, saying, we find nothing wrong with this man, suppose or spirit or an angel has spoken to him. 
And so the difference is the Sadducees accepted only the Pentateuch as divinely in inspired scripture, so a lot like the uh, the Samaritans in that respect. They thought uh, wrongly, as Jesus, is, Jesus pointed out in the Gospels, that the Torah did not teach a resurrection, and, and in fact it does, so the Sadducees rejected it. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection and the afterlife. Many Pharisees are recorded as coming to belief and faith in Jesus, but the Bible does not record a single Sadducee as doing so, and it just it just seems like they were too far away from the truth to uh, to you know to for it to <laughs> for the Holy Spirit to work. They were closed off and, and hard hearts. There may have been some Pharisees like Yochanan and Shimon we mentioned earlier who sided with Paul. And again, we don't know if they were believers in secret, just like Nicodemus, or they were just interested in in justice being uh, you know being being served and being faithful here. Now that the door was open, they can defend Paul openly which is what they do here. Uh, we also probably see some enemy of my enemy is my friend motives happening here. Um, Pharisees, you know, probably were more than happy to stand up for Paul on these grounds and, and you know, get a little dig in at the Sadducees. There's a corny line that helps uh, people remember the differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and, and you may have heard it. It says, the, Sar the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and that's why they're sad, you see. And that's, that's corny, but it helps us keep the, the, the differentiation between the Pharisees and Sadducees Sadducees who were total opposites from each other. We, we don't have a lot of familiarity with these groups, especially during the time of Jesus' trial, but they were very different and they were very numerous. And when a great dissension occurred, the commander was afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, and he ordered troops to go down and take them by force and bring him back into the barracks. The commander of the Roman cohort is usually considered to um, be stationed in the fortress of Antonia. And we looked at this in chapter 22 uh, when Paul had the, the first riot that he was plucked away from chapter 21. So this model of Jerusalem is during the time of uh, the first century. And it shows us how the, the towers provided a view of the temple complex. And, and so the temple was on the north side. And so they could see down into it looking, uh, looking towards the south. And, you know, they could spot potential unrest. And, uh, you know, again, uh, they may have actually saved Paul's life by doing this. Josephus records other alter altercations uh, between the Pharisees and Sadducees. In one instance, he writes, a skirmish between the high priests and the principal men of the multitude, in other words, the Pharisees, ended with both sides casting stones at each other. So things got heated. We think our um, our politics today is, uh, you know, hostile. It was just, just the same way in that day, if not worse. This outcome here is probably the best Paul could have hoped for. And um, Lysias, too, maybe thought he got the resolution he wanted. Paul was acquitted and could have been set free. But on the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Be courageous, for as you have testified to the truth about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome also. And the following night, again, was probably the same evening as the council hearing. Remember, the, the next day started at sundown, so tomorrow <laughs> would end at, at, at sundown tonight, and this is the way we would look at. So that this is the next vision that Paul receives from Jesus, and it affirms that he will not be killed in his homeland, but he will live to see Rome. It is Jesus' will that his servants suffer, but it's also his will that he is right there with us. And this reminds me of the, uh, the Lord's words to Joshua in Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For Paul, this will include going before the most powerful man in the world uh, in front of Caesar himself. When it was daylight, the Jews formed a conspiracy and put themselves under an oath, saying they would not, neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. This, uh, there was more than 40, there were more than 40 who formed this plot. Obviously, not all Jews. Paul had many supporters, as we just saw. This was some Jews formed a plot. And apparently, Paul's enemies knew that an acquittal was certain, and without the Pharisee support, they knew they could never get a conviction in the Sanhedrin. And this is more ends justify the means. So this this guy's bad. We have to we have to take him out. Um, and John sixteen two, Jesus says, you know, again, this is all fulfillment. They will ban you from the synagogue. An hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that they are offering a service to God. 
And so, uh, again, fulfillment of prophecy is, is the, the rejection here. This is very puzzling, this oath here, because they invoked God's judgment against them if they failed. And so they're, <laughs> they're committing murder, and, uh, which is against God's law, of course, and, and they want God's blessing. So, again, the lesson for us is we can't sin and expect God's blessing. So if, if there's sin in our lives, we need to deal with it. And, and we're going to see these guys' <laughs> these guys' plots get a little foiled here. In the Gospels, um, we d- recently discussed the word Corban, and this is the same idea here. They're saying, Corban, be food or drink until uh, Saul or Paul is dead. I don't recommend ever taking this kind of oath. These tactics remind some commentators of uh, a, a group of zealots known as the Sicarii, and they were um, vehemently fighting, uh, violently fighting for Jewish independence. They typically em- employed terrorist tactics, and they had a, gen- a xenophobic hatred for Gentiles. And so they associated they associated all Gentiles as 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 their Roman occupiers. The most common form of justice that we know of from the Sicurii, and I use justice in quotes there, they would blend in with a crowd of people with a concealed dagger and then sneak out and slit someone's throat, and then they blend right back into the crowd before anyone knew what had happened. So they were, uh, they were yeah, true terrorists in, in every sense. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have put ourselves under an oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you as though you were going to investigate his case more thoroughly. And as for us, we are ready to kill him uh, before he comes near the place. So they're lying in wait. You're going to sneak out. No, there's no Pharisees mentioned as co-conspirators here. This is all between the Sakari zealots and and the Sadducees, which is interesting because there was no love lost between those groups either. Um, the Sakari was any friend of Rome was an enemy, and and the the Sadducees were friends of Rome's. But here, you know, the age old proverb: politics makes strange bell- bedfellows, or the enemy on my enemy is my friend. All of that applies here. You know, when uh, when the ends justify the means. So the people who accuse Paul of violating the law of Moses are ready to kill him without trial. So you have to you know, see the irony there. They wanted to lead Paul into an ambush and during the daylight hours, which is usually, you know, ambushes are much better executed at night. And so they're, they're so bold, they're going to do it during the daylight. The high priest here, again, is also charged with upholding God's law. He's ready to commit an act of premeditated murder. So we can just see the corruption and the compromise all, all through this. On a side note here, I, I can't resist bringing up Judas Iscariot. Most commentators believe that Judas Iscariot means uh, Ish Kiriot, uh, meaning a man of, of Kiriot or Kiriath. And Kiriath is a town that is in Judah. It's about 12 miles south of he- Hebron. And this would make Judas the only apostle that was not from Galilee. So he was an outsider, um, even by, by virtue of where he was born. Now, why am I bringing up this up here? Others believe that Iscariot could re- refer to Ish Sikriot which is the plural form of Sakari in Hebrew. And that's the Sakari terrorist that we were just talking about that had the plot to kill Paul. So the thought here is Judas betrayed Jesus not out of hatred or monetary gain, but out of a belief that Jesus was the one who could overthrow Rome and usher in the kingdom. And in, uh, in season four of The Chosen, they appear to be going in this direction. Jude, Judas is not a bad man. He just wants his will and not God's will in overthrowing the Romans and you know, starting the revolution there. But the son of Paul's sister heard about their ambush, and he came and entered the barracks and told Paul. So Paul was obviously had uh, visitation privileges here. Paul called one of the centurions himself and said, Take this young man to the commander, for he has something to report to him. Paul's very careful about guarding this message and not having too many people know. Forty, though, is apparently too many people to be in on a plan to keep it a secret. Paul was in protective custody again. He was able to receive visitors. It's curious that in Luke and Acts, centurions are always the good guys. And so uh, it's, it's puzzling. It's a theme you want to notice as you read Luke and Acts. The Romans are, are never, <laughs> never necessarily the bad guys. So he took him and led him to the commander and said, Paul, the prisoner called me over to him and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took him by the hand and stepping aside, began to inquire of him privately saying, what is it that you have to report to me? And uh, Paul's nephew said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down tomorrow to the council as though they were going to inquire somewhat more thoroughly about him. Do not listen to them, for more than 40 of them are in hiding to ambush him. These men have put themselves under an oath not to eat or drink until they kill Paul, and now they are ready and waiting for some assurance from you. Then the commander let the young man go, instructing him, tell no one that you have notified me about these things. 
And he called to him two of the centurions and said, get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night, meaning nine o'clock, to proceed to Caesarea with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen. They were to provide mounts to put, uh, put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor in Caesarea. Here's a reenactment of some Roman soldiers. Uh, the, the numbers seem excessive, 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen, uh, but here Lysias is not leaving anything to chance. He had no idea how many additional Sicarii could be mustered by the original 40. And to his credit, and maybe unlike Pilate here, Lysias takes the threat extremely seriously. Pilate probably would have sent Paul back to the council, and if something happened, you know, so be it, not my problem anymore. But for here, you know, at least Lysias is looking out for him. Again, you know, the spirit is moving because Paul was uh, told he was going to go to Rome, and, and Lysias has a part to play in that. For Paul's own sake, and, and probably for Lysias' sake as well, he wanted to get Paul out of Jerusalem before the place absolutely exploded. Paul's going to get an armed escort here to make sure he arrives to Caesarea safely. And this is, you know, half, if, if his garrison that he had in uh, Jerusalem was a thousand men, this is half of Lysias' garrison here, You're not taking any chances. Um, they set out, you know, a few hours later, this is the springtime of the year, uh, late spring, and so um, probably dark around six or seven, and, you know, a couple hours later, they're heading out. So way too soon for any plan to be modified if word happened to get out about the, the prisoner transfer. So Paul will, in fact, be heard before governors and kings in Caesarea. Probably was not even enough time for Paul to say goodbye to his friends and disciples and, and family. Uh, he will never see his, his beloved Jerusalem again. And so we wonder if he wept over it like maybe Jesus, like maybe like Jesus did. And he wrote a letter with the following content, Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor, Felix, greetings. So the... the um, the leader here is, has not been named up to this point, but we, we learn here that the Roman's name is Claudius Lysias. Paul will be heard before governors and kings, starting with Felix, uh, who was the governor of the province of Judea from 52 to 59 uh, AD. This document is a, a legal filing, and this is a formal referral uh, and, and, and statement of facts. When this man was seized by the Jews and about to be killed by them, I came up to them with the troops and rescued him after learning that he was a Roman. So Lysias takes some bureaucratic liberty here, not missing a chance to present himself as favorably and as heroically as possible to the Roman governor. Kind of funny there. Uh, Lysias did not come to the aid of a Roman citizen, but uh, he didn't find out that Paul was a citizen until he was about to beat him. He leaves that part out of the letter here. Luke's transparency indicates here that he had firsthand knowledge of the letter's contents. It's very detailed here. Wanting to ascertain, Lysias continues, wanting to ascertain the basis for the charges they were bringing against him. I brought him down to their council and found that he was being accused regarding questions in their law, but was not charged with anything deserving death or imprisonment. So Paul is walking in Jesus's footsteps in many respects. Again, wrongly accused, he'll be wrongly convicted and, and executed. Um, by mentioning no Roman crimes, Lysias is proclaiming Paul innocent here, just as Pilate uh, inadvertently proclaimed Jesus innocent and yet proceeded to uh, kill him as a criminal. So they're as innocent as a lamb or a young child. That's what the picture is meant to uh, display here. Neither Paul nor Jesus was released as they should have been. While Pilate's refusal to release Jesus could be attributed to expediency and cowardice, Lysias at least has a better excuse. It's unsafe for Paul in Jerusalem. When I was informed that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, also instructing his accusers to bring charges against him before you. So he's, he's sending the, you know, the, the prosecution is, is also on their way to Jerusalem, but they don't get an armed escort. Um, as for any embellishment of the facts, you know, these only aid Paul's case and Lysias can trust Paul not to put Lysias in a bad light with Felix, you know, calling out uh, the guy who just saved your life, probably not a good move. So Paul's going to keep quiet. Uh, as is the situation in most courts today, there's always a backlog of cases to be tried. And so Lysias is imparting a sense of urgency here, and this might have helped uh, move Paul's case up on the docket. So the soldiers, in accordance with their orders, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And somewhere in Jerusalem, some zealots are getting very hungry and very thirsty. They would have been doomed to die of starvation unless they could find, you know, some loophole for getting their, their vows annulled. And so this is the official beginning of Paul's final journey to Rome. So he's going to leave from Jerusalem, head up to Antipatris, 
Um, the area around Jerusalem was very mountainous, and so it would have been taxes, taxing on those walking and on the horses. So they, they could not have made um, you know, all the way to uh, Caesarea, which is about 50 or 60 miles. And Epatris was a Roman post that's about 40 miles from Jerusalem, about nine miles from the coast. It's not far from Lydda, which is where Paul, uh, Peter sorry, here healed uh, Aeneas, which, who was the man who was lame for eight years back in Acts chapter 9. Lydda is roughly where the airport, Ben Gurion Airport, is today. Typically, they only cover 20 or 30 miles in a day, but here they leave at 9 o'clock, and they could cover a little more ground here. Troops, Roman troops had to be uh, ready and able to undertake all-night marches when necessary, so maybe they, they moved at even four, even five miles per hour. But on the next day, they left the horsemen uh, go on without them, and they returned to the barracks. So they're now in Samaritan and Gentile territory, and the threat of a Jewish-led ambush is greatly diminished. The foot soldiers can head back to Jerusalem while the rest of the crew makes their way on up to Caesarea. When these horsemen had come to Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor. They also presented Paul to him. So in a stroke of the Holy Spirit, Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, returns to the very place where the Spirit first fell upon Gentiles um, that and signified their inclusion in the Messianic kingdom. So Paul is back here in Caesarea. Now, when uh, Felix had read it, he was asked from what province Paul was. When he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing while your accusers arrive, when your accusers arrive as well, giving orders for Paul to be kept in Herod's Praetorium. So Felix read the letter out loud and then had to make sure he had the right jurisdiction to hear Paul's case. Uh, Judea and Cilicia and Tarsus were both under the uh, the legate of Syria, and Felix was the governor of both regions, so no problem there. Paul, as a Roman citizen, had the right to be tried in his home or where the alleged crime was committed. And so, you know, nothing happened in Caesarea, so, you know, the, he, he wanted to make sure there was no, no ability for a change of venue here. So Luke records this technical detail as strong proof that Luke attended the hearing. He was there and hearing it firsthand and gives weight to the assertion that some believe Luke was tasked with compiling trial documentation for Paul as directed by Theophilus. So here you can see a picture of Caesarea. You can see the theater in the background. And then this is the promontory, the little peninsula where King Herod many decades earlier had built his palace. And so we can see the grounds of what remains um, the rectangle in the center of this would have been where the upper palace of Herod and Paul was likely kept somewhere in this area. It had accommodations for soldiers, palace guards, and other workers, maybe even a prison. Although um, we can't say Paul's accommodations were five-star, but he likely wasn't in ordinary jail either. Maybe something like a house arrest or protective custody might be the appropriate term to think about. We were there recently, and they just uh, be begun excavating underneath the, the surface level you see here. And there's a whole nother layer of, uh, of rooms and, and maybe prisons and whatnot. So um, Herod knew how to build things and it's a fascinating place to be. That's why archeology span is so much fun just because they're, they're finding new stuff all the time. So Paul is once again in the middle of a pagan town with temples and idols everywhere. Caesarea was a you know, Rome, <laughs> little Rome of the East, not the same as Caesarea Philippi, uh, which was more inland. This is on the coast here but uh, all, very much every bit as, as pagan and, and idolatrous. So Paul, again, in familiar but uncomfortable lands at the same time. We'll continue uh, this saga next time in Acts chapter 24 when the prosecution arrives, and we'll see you next time along the Talmudim way. Mm -hmm.